Good morning. So my name is Bethany, uh, and my goal this morning is to give you an overview of interactions between invasive species and climate change. So some of these uh, interactions are things that you've probably already noticed and observed, some things uh, a little bit further down the pike in terms of when they're likely to occur. Um, I come from Massachusetts, so um, some of what I'm going to be talking about is, is more general than, uh, than just Montana, um, but hopefully, um, hopefully many of these sort of general take-home messages are ones that you can apply and think about in terms of your particular circumstances that you're dealing with in terms of weed management in Montana. Um, I am part of the Northeast Regional Invasive Species and Climate Change Management Network or RISC Network. So if these topics are ones that you wanna hear more about, you're most welcome to join our listserv. We push information out, you know, kind of every couple of weeks. There's not a huge amount of traffic on the listserv, but, um, but we do try to keep everybody updated on um, the latest uh, publications and, um, information on the interactions between invasive species and climate change. You can find us if you Google um, risk network um, and I will include a link at the end of this presentation too. Um, another thing is if uh, you'd like a cheat sheet in terms of these interactions between invasive species and climate change, we have a two page, what we call management challenge that we put together through the Northeast Risk Network uh, that goes over these sort of major interactions. And this is just a screen capture of the first page of it. Uh, the back goes through the different case studies of, of interaction. So you can download that on our website at risknetwork.org. All right, so we're here largely because we're all dealing with weedy invasive plant species. Um, invasive plants seem like they're bad enough, right? We've got lots of different species that we're dealing with, lots of new challenges that keep coming, coming along in terms of invasion ecology. And now I'm saying, and lots of people are saying, we need to add climate change to this mix. Um, and so what I want to remind you guys of is, even though these are two major challenges that we're putting together, that invasive species management, weed management is already proactive, that we are already thinking about new invasive species that are coming into our management areas. We're constantly thinking about new ways, better ways to control species. We're thinking about you know, where are the areas that we wanna prioritize because they're most vulnerable to these invasions in terms of ecosystems, in terms of economies. And so while adding climate change to this mix is daunting, is another grand challenge ahead for us in invasive species management. It's also another opportunity to take these uh, actions that we're already doing that are that are already proactive and just be thinking a little bit further ahead a little bit longer term um, in terms of what it means to be proactive for what's coming next because climate change is going to be changing the scope of the types of species that you're managing the timing of uh, the control efforts that you're doing and the types of ecosystems that are most vulnerable to invasion so the more we can learn about uh, those interactions, the more we can plan ahead, the better off we're going to be um, in terms of uh, successfully managing those species. So this is an outline of the topics that I wanna to cover today. So first we're gonna talk about how rising temperature favors invasives um, and especially invasive plants. We're gonna talk about species range shifts associated with climate change. We're going to talk a little bit about disturbance and how um, climate extremes and variability create disturbance for invasions. And then lastly, we'll talk about plant response to rising CO2 and how that could favor invasive species. So we'll start with number one. Uh, so warming temperatures and longer growing seasons, these are virtually certain according to the IPCC report from 2013. There's a more recent IPCC report, so I don't know how more virtually certain we can get, but we've already observed um, <clears throat> quite a number of heat waves, warming, uh, warmer summers, warmer winters, longer growing seasons is pretty well observed at this point and predicted to increase in the future. And so this is a uh, this is a meta analysis. So the question is, okay, well, if temperatures are warming, 
uh, does that favor invasive species? Uh, so a meta-analysis is essentially where you go into the peer-reviewed literature, you find a whole bunch of studies that have looked at, for example, how well native species, so native or in the blue here, versus is uh, invasive species in the red, how well those two species grown together um, do perform basically under elevated temperature, under increased or decreased precipitation. And this effect size that you see along the x-axis is essentially these, the species do better when you're positive, the species do worse when you're negative. And the little star basically on here shows that invasive species do significantly better under elevated temperature, whereas native species do not. Native species do about the same in terms of performance, and these performance metrics could be you know, growth rate or seed production or whatever you might measure in terms of plant performance. Okay, so according to a meta-analysis, looking at a whole bunch of different studies that have compared the performance of native and invasive plants, the invasive plants are consistently doing significantly better um, when temperatures are warmed. So why might that be? Um, one reason for this might be something called priority effects. And priority effects, basically, another way to say it is the early bird catches the worm, where as you get warmer temperatures, you also end up with longer growing seasons. And invasive species tend to be uh, the species that are, are able to kind of run out of the starting gate really fast um, given that opportunity. So invasive species are uh, what we would call sort of plastic in their response. That is they're flexible in terms of the timing of that growing season. And so if they can move earlier, then they end up with this priority effect. And these are some examples from the East Coast or the upper Midwest. So uh, buckthorn invasion, you can see this sort of like green underneath a um, forest canopy that has not greened up yet. Same thing with Japanese barberry. This is a big problem out in the Northeast US, um, greening up much earlier than the forest canopy. And so that gives them this uh, light advantage and other resource advantage um, by uh, greening up earlier. And as you have warmer temperatures, you also have this longer growing season and an increase in the priority effects for invasive species. Another reason um, that temperature might uh, favor invasive plants is that idea of phenological plasticity. So phenology being sort of the timing of growth in those plants um, and plasticity being the ability to kind of move your timing um, in response to warmer temperatures. This is a study, um, this is a graph from a study that was done also in the Northeast. Um, so this was um, looking at botanical records over about a hundred years that were collected in um, around the, uh, the Arnold Arboretum, which is Harvard's um, our botanical garden, basically. Um, and so what they found was that native and actually non-native, non-native but non-invasive species over that hundred year time period from 1900 to 2010 or thereabouts had not shifted the timing of their flowering at all. They were flowering at the same time, whatever they're responding to, um, maybe it's day length, you know, maybe it's something else, but it had not changed over that time period. But when they compared native species versus invasive species, so invasives being specifically the ones that are expanding their populations um, and spreading across landscapes, they found that the invasive species compared, to, so the native stayed here, the invasives had shifted their flowering time earlier by nearly two weeks, so about 11 days earlier over this 100-year time period. And uh, they tried to figure out, you know, all kinds of different things that might correlate to this, um, to this response, and they found that temperature was the best correlate suggesting basically that invasive species, as it's warming, they're shifting their time period early and earlier. They're very responsive to that temperature. The natives are more stuck um, in response to day length or some other phenological cues. And so this sort of reinforces that potential for a priority effect, give a plant 12 extra days relative to its competitor, and it's probably going to do pretty well.
So a take home point um, on, this, uh, on this part of rising temperatures favoring invasives, that invasive species consistently, invasive plants especially, seem to be able to take advantage of these longer growing seasons, that they can emerge early, um, gain these extra resources early before competitors, and that ultimately increases um, both their ability to spread as well as their impacts. Next piece is thinking about rain shifts. So the important thing to remember about climate change is that it's happening really fast, um, much, much faster than any kind of climate changes that anybody's been able to document in uh, paleo history, going back hundreds of thousands of years to millions of years, you know, where something like um, thousands of times faster change going on right now than, than we have any documented record in, um, in paleo history. So I'm from Massachusetts. So this is sort of what it looks like for Massachusetts. This is where Massachusetts was both geographically and also in terms of climate space in the late 1900s. Um, this is approximately where Massachusetts is in terms of climate space today. And we're moving quite rapidly um, in terms of our current trajectory is somewhere in the, you know, the Southeast US climate space um, within the next uh, 80 years, basically. So that's a huge change in terms of climate conditions. And when we think about, all right, so how are species able to respond to this rapid shift? Well, one thing that they're gonna need to do is to move, right? So how fast are native species moving? Um, this, is a, this is a really nice example, one from forest ecosystems. It was measured in Southern Vermont. So in the Green Mountains, which are in Southern Vermont. And in the uh, mid 1960s, the Forest Service had gone out and measured a bunch of transects to figure out where is the border between the Northern hardwood and the higher elevation boreal forest in the Green Mountains. And then in 2004, they went out and repeated those transects. And they found, so consistent with climate change, northern hard, hardwood forest trees were expanding upwards in elevation and boreal forest trees were contracting from that lower edge. So moving in the sort of upward direction at both, uh, both edges. But the speed at which that was happening was over this 40 years, that edge had shifted by about 600 feet. Right, so 600 feet in 40 years. Again, these are trees, so we don't expect them to be like racing up the slope or anything. But still, this is something that we need to contrast. 600 feet in 40 years versus 800 miles that they need to move in 80 years, right? So not very fast. So our native species are just not equipped um, on their own to keep up with this super rapid rate of climate change. So instead, who gets favored, right? Well, the ones that get favored are not necessarily the ones that the lovely bird is moving along or the ones that are blowing through the air. The ones that get favored are the ones that we are moving around. It is the, the bamboo that we are deliberately planting in our yard in, uh, into these expanded climate spaces. It is certainly all of those uh, weeds and other stuff stuck to uh, boats um, and other equipment. Um, you know, mowers that get moved around. So what we're giving a head start to effectively are the invasive species. Those are the ones that are most associated with people um, that are having the, the fastest response to climate change. Um, and if you look at, so this, these are invasive plants writ large across the US. So we had modeled um, almost 900 different invasive plant species that are either regulated species or ones that are part of the invasive plant atlas of the US to look at where are the areas that are likely to receive more invasive plants as climate shifts and where are the areas that are likely to stay the same or even you know, lose some populations of, uh, of their current suite of invasive plants. And you can see that Montana has a lot of the kind of yellow to red colors. So those are areas in the US, these sort of Northern areas are likely to be recipients of more invasive species that are moving into the area from parts further South. So one thing that I wanna highlight here that, um, that Jenica Allen um, has put together, she's at Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts. 
uh, and with the collaboration of folks at uh, EdMaps is this rain shift listing tool. So you can, for the state of Montana, now go onto EdMaps um, and find this rain shift listing tool and download a list of all of the different plant species that are not currently in Montana, but are likely to shift into Montana by mid-century with climate change. Uh, and you can see that for Montana, at least based on the criteria that I put in in the search, that there were 42 new species um, likely to expand um, into at least one part of Montana by 2050. And one thing that we've been doing in the Northeast, um, because the Northeast also is a major hotspot of future uh, incoming invasive species, one thing that we've been doing is taking those watch lists um, and then running impacts assessments on them. So essentially trying to hone down a list of so in the case of New England, it's, uh, it's more like 150 species that are shifting into New England. Uh, for Montana with the 40, you know, 40 plus species um, shifting in, that's a lot of new species to deal with. So on the science side, one of our priorities has been to hone that down to identify the ones that have the highest impact and the most likelihood to affect ecosystems um, in the Northeast area. So, you know, the ones that um, invade mangrove forests, for example, you know, probably not as high a priority to, to watch out for in the Northeast. So take home point on this is that invasive species ranges are shifting, but what's kind of cool about knowing what the landscape in the US looks like uh, in terms of weedy species is that we can tell, you know, we can look ahead and actually know the identity of the species that are coming in. And that means that we actually have a chance to get ahead of some of them by, you know, putting those at the top of our list for early detection and rapid response by uh, potentially putting them on the regulatory list if those are species that are sold um, as, uh, as ornamental plants. The climate, this is sort of the silver lining of climate change is that chance to, uh, to be proactive and know what's coming. Third piece on here is this idea that climate variability in and of itself creates disturbance. So climate change creates extremes. Those extremes are uh, negatively impacting our native ecosystems. This is an example of a study that was done for forest ecosystems specifically. And across the Western US, you can see that there are a lot of studies across the West. Across the Western US, forest die off has consistently been linked to drought, extreme droughts. In the Eastern US, tree mortality has been linked to um, the heat more than drought. So hot summers and uh, severe um, winters. So definitely lots of different evidence that these climate ex extremes are going to, um, you know, sort of create this double whammy effect, um, further uh, decrease the resilience of our, our native ecosystems. And certainly in the Western US, you know, you've got fire on top of this whole thing. This is one of those, you know, made huge changes to, to landscapes where you're wiping out entire areas of um, especially forested areas. And this particular study is basically just showing that the area of forest fires has increased quite a bit as fuels have dried out more through time. So the red dots in here are all of the 2000 through 2015 fire years. 1984 to 1999 are in blue. And you can see this sort of like, as you end up up here, you have drier fuels and much larger fires. So that's a trend that we can expect to continue over time. And certainly we know that invasive species thrive when you have increased disturbance. The um, figure on the left is one from a forest understory. So this is a, a species called garlic mustard, which is a major problem in the East Coast. As you add disturbance um, and you have propagal pressure, you end up with, when you have both of those two things together, large uh, changes in the density of that particular invasive species. So it needs the disturbance, not just the propagules to actually thrive. And certainly I, I suspect that many of you have seen landscapes like this where you have uh, large scale invasions following fire um, in shrub to, to woodland ecosystems. <laughs> 
So a take home point here is that climate extremes are creating novel forms of disturbance that those harm native ecosystems and they provide an opening or an opportunity for more invasive species to gain a foothold and spread throughout ecosystems. And then a fourth point um, in terms of interactions between invasive species and climate change is the idea that, well, the observation that CO2 levels are rising and continue to rise. Um, we are now well over 400 parts per million. Um, and this is coming from if you, you know, if we were able to extend this back, the, this particular record started in the late 1950s. Um, but other records, we can see that pre-industrial, we are actually down closer to 280 parts per million. Um, and quite a number of scientists have said that if we want to preserve ecosystems as we know them sort of going forward, then 350 is really the number that we need to be aiming for as sort of our future for, for climate change mitigation. Um, and this is just sort of an aside, but I, I think this is a super cool pattern, this little sawtooth in here. So if you haven't seen, you've probably seen this graph before, but the explanation for this little sawtooth is essentially that, you know, northern hemisphere in the US, or sorry, in the world, the, the, the whole northern hemisphere has a lot more land mass on it than the southern hemisphere, which is mostly ocean. Um, and as you get into sort of the northern springtime and you have all of these terrestrial systems starting to green up, that's when you go down. It's essentially the whole northern hemisphere starting to inhale all of the CO2 as all of our plant biomass is growing. And then we're sort of at the, you know, still going up kind of edge right now uh, at the end of the winter um, when everything's relatively dormant in the northern hemisphere and there isn't as much um, by quite a bit plant biomass to, to suck in CO2 in the southern hemisphere. So anyway, all of that is this example, of course, that CO2 is really important for plants that as we remember from, you know, ninth grade biology or whenever that was, uh, that CO2, water, um, and light are what plants need to photosynthesize. Um, so as you add more CO2 to the atmosphere, that is a resource for plants. And so overall, plants do better as you add more of this CO2 resource to them. Um, this is a sort of general averages, but you know, trees grow faster, crops grow faster, shrubs grow faster, herbs grow faster, um, and you end up with more flowers, more fruits, more seed mass. Um, and I like this, I like this figure at the bottom. This is actually one that was on a website um, supported by Exxon Mobil, um, you know, not too long ago in terms of trying to make the argument that actually all the CO2 is great for the atmosphere because it creates, you know, better growth in all of our trees. The problem is that there is also huge variation around these, you know, plus 50% trees, right? So pine trees may grow faster, but what they don't tell you is that also makes the trees a lot weaker, brittle, um, and not very good for lumber kind of thing. Also true for invasive species. So invasives relative to natives do much better than, uh, sorry, invasives do much better relative to natives as you add CO2 to the atmosphere. So this is that same meta-analysis that we saw before we looked at with temperature. Now I'm adding the CO2 bar in here. So again, you can see there are, and also these numbers over here are numbers of studies. So there are lots and lots of studies that have looked at how do invasive species do under elevated CO2? How do native species do under elevated CO2? You can see that the blue bar, the natives are doing better. So you can see that like they're not really crossing the zero line here or just about. So that suggests that on average, just about all native species are gonna do, have better performance under elevated CO2, but invasive species are just doing even more, even more better um, for the, the invasive species. Um, the mechanism here isn't fully fleshed out, but probably the reason behind this is because 
as you know, uh, weedier species tend to grow fast. They tend to produce lots of seeds. Um, they have good plant performance to begin with. And all of that fast growth, lots of seed production requires a lot of resources. So if you add even more resources uh, to the mix, then your weedier species do even better. The other thing that happens is that they end up uh, more resistant to herbicides. So this was a study that was done in the early 2000s with Canada thistle um, and was repeated for a number of different, uh, you know, four or five other weedy species with similar results. And essentially what happened is these, these are two plots that are grown side by side. Um, and what they did was in this plot, they just had the regular ambient CO2. In this one, they had elevated CO2. And both of these plots had the, whatever the recommended amount of glyphosate sprayed on them. So you can see under ambient CO2, for the most part, that took care of most of these species, except for that guy. But under future CO2, not so much at all. And the reason was because what they found was that under elevated CO2, Canada thistle puts a lot more biomass below ground, grows much hardier roots. Um, and so that means that it has more root stock to recover after, um, after herbicide. So all plants do better with more CO2, but those relative improvements really matter. And so we need to watch out for these hardier, um, harder to kill weedy species. All right, and so in my last, my last few side, slides, the question is, so what do we do about this stuff? Um, first, we have a synthesis uh, on the Risk Network um, website called Taking Action, which is a synthesis that uh, we put together based on feedback from invasive species managers at the NASMA, the North American Invasive Species Management Association, meeting in 2019. So these were all of your ideas that we compiled together and put into this document. So if you're looking for other ideas of what other managers are thinking, um, this is a place to look for it. So here are some examples. We've got a problem of invasive plants emerging earlier and becoming more competitive with warming temperatures. Um, so in terms of treatment and control, what do we need to do? We need to uh, plan for an earlier management season because invasive species are going to be emerging earlier. We need to be testing new management techniques now uh, for ones that might become more or less effective as CO2 rises, as there are changes in, in temperature. Um, we need to be thinking about what co what's coming next. So that rain shifting tool is one way to do it, but we don't necessarily need a science tool to do all of these things. One thing that we could do is to develop more partnerships, for example, with neighboring states. You know, So talking to people from Idaho and Wyoming and the Dakotas to get information about you know, what are they dealing with. Um, also, Montana is a big state. So you know, if you're in the Northern parts, make sure you're talking to, to folks in the southern parts of the state to get a sense of what's coming next. We have this other problem of climate change causing these novel disturbances and creating this sort of double whammy effect of both uh, susceptibility to climate change and susceptibility to invasion. So this is gonna require some hard choices in terms of strategic planning. You know, What are our priority conservation areas? Um, or recreation areas that are going to be the ones that we want to defend against the most um, or restore as priorities um, should one or more of these disturbances happen. Um, and then the, in terms of the range shifting, um, we, I said this before, but we have a chance to get ahead of a lot of these species right now. We can have a pretty good sense of what's coming next. Um, some of what needs to happen is very much on the policy side. So prohibiting the sales of species that we know are um, part of the ornamental plant trade and are sold, uh, watching out especially for sort of the pathways that these weedy species are going to be coming in on you know, equipment, um, on soil exchanges, those types of, uh, of things that we already know about. They become even more important um, as we add climate change to the mix. 
And then lastly is to keep building your networks. So there are two new uh, regional invasive species and climate change management networks starting up. One is in the Northwest US, um, and these are both under the umbrella of the Climate Adaptation Science Centers, which are USGS supported centers. So if you're interested in kind of hearing more, or being on the, the first email list of these two networks, there's one in the Northwest led by Rachel Gregg, her email is there. There's also one in the North Central US led by Chelsea Nagy um, and her email um, as well. So please feel free to contact those folks to get some, some ideas about what they're, they're up to next. And uh, we in the Northeast have a pretty well-established at this point risk management network. So if you're interested in learning more, a lot of the information that we put out is not just kind of Northeast focused, it is more general. Um, and we'd love to have you join us. Um, if you go to risknetwork.org, you can find those management challenges that I mentioned before, the double trouble, which is about the science between invasive species and climate change or taking action about the, you know, manager, manager generated, in fact, this is a picture of that, that workshop that we did, manager generated ideas about how we respond to or, or build climate smart invasive species management. Um, so all that information is on our website, along with information about how to sign up for our listserv. So thank you so much for listening to me and I am happy to take any questions.